Hey, buddy. Welcome back. Evan UG, original Grognard, sitting down at the table. What are we looking at? We are looking at Second World War at Sea from Avalanche Press. We're going to be doing an overview and taking a look at the operational side of things. Uh, a couple of videos back, uh, I did a series highlighting the game on the tactical board, but now we're going to be taking a look at how the operational side of things uh, kind of work, and we're doing this kind of in preparation because I'm going to give one of the Coral Sea operations a shot, the shorter one. Um, the Coral Sea game that they released, uh, that Avalanche Press released, I, was like 20 bucks. And kind of, kind of, I don't want to call it a starter, but it kind of is a starter kit for, uh, for Second World War at Sea, if you can get your hands on it anymore. Um, but it's got like three or four tactical scenarios and two operational scenarios. And honestly, most of the scenarios that are in this are in SOPAC. So <laughs> it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of just a, a, a nice, short, quick starter kit, you know, that you only have to pay 20 bucks to get your feet wet on the system rather than spending the 70, 80, 90 bucks for one of the full box set games. Um, and obviously, Coral Sea is going to be covering just the one battle, the first aircraft to aircraft carrier to aircraft carrier engagement of the war. Uh, Probably, in my opinion, the most important one. Um, there really was only six carrier-on-carrier -carrier engagements throughout the entire war, and four of them happened in 1942. Uh, Coral Sea, Midway, let's see if I can remember these all off the top of my head, Eastern Solomons, Philippine Sea, Oh, what was the what was the fifth one? No, I think Philippine Sea was the. F oh, damn it! I used to know all these by heart. Coral Sea, Midway, Eastern Solomons, Philippine Sea. One other one, and the final one that nobody ever cares about. But anyways, there were only six six carrier on carrier engagements. I, I honestly think uh, Coral Sea was probably the most important one because it set up the victory of Midway and Midway was basically the turning point of the war. Um, all the other carrier battles that came after it, not I mean, tactically at the time were important, but from an overall uh, grand strategy view, they just they weren't as important as, say, Midway and Coral Sea. Midway, a lot of people say that be the mo was the most important one. I would say Coral Sea because Coral Sea set up the conditions that allowed us to win at, uh, at, at Midway. And I could go on for a very long time about that, but I'm not going to because that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at the game, Second World War, it's a Coral Sea battle from Avalanche Press. All right, so as we already discussed, we already covered the tactical side, and there's the tactical board right there. So, what happens during the operational side of things? Well, in the operational side of things, that's when you're maneuvering your fleets around. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of these fleet, the task force markers right here. These are American task forces. And you place these on the board, and you have the actual task force number hidden from your opponent because... Let's see if I can move some of this stuff out of the way here. Yeah, this this game does take up some space, so I'm I'm glad I got my little my little sideboard right here. Um, you've got the task force cards, you know, task force one, two, three, four, and you put the ships in there, and of course it's all coordinated with. All right, there's task force four. You put that on the operational map, and then task force four, whatever ships are in it, you put right there. And then if you need to, you break it out and go to the tactical side of things. Um, this map actually is kind of one of the smaller ones Coral Sea is, so packs about the same size. Eastern Fleet's pretty big uh, for what it covers, um, but depending on, you know, the game system, the, the, the operational maps 
are going to be kind of big, so it does take up some space. And like I said, I kind of have limited space. This one I could probably get away with doing. I could probably get away with doing SOPAC on this table. I don't think I could get Eastern Fleet on here uh, without, you know, having to keep the tactical map someplace else and do the tactical fights off the board. Uh, the Eastern Eastern Fleet probably takes up, you know, half of my table space here. Um, so anyways, it is kind of a large game, and since it is an operational, and, you know, it's six hours per turn, and you're talking campaigns that can go, some of the shorter campaigns, you know, three, four days, upwards of 10, 20, 30 days, so you're not going to be getting some of the bigger campaign games done in, you know, an evening, <laughs> uh, so you're going to be having to have leave this set up for a while if you're thinking of doing it long term all right so but anyways according to whatever scenario you got you can go ahead and you put your little markers out on the board like that let's go ahead and zoom in and you have an order sheet that you write orders down let's go ahead and take a look at the player log basically each task force is set on a mission and you write the orders down and this is kind of set up how is this set up so you got the three day turns you've got a twilight turn and then you've got two night turns although you can't really see that the night turns are kind of shaded um and i really don't like the these hash marks that are put in for the twilight turn because it's tough to read what you've written in there um so but you know it's, it's workable uh, so each turn is six hours long, and depending on what type of task force you have, and the, and the main overall mission of the task force determines how far out in advance you have to write your orders. So let's go ahead and take a look at the rules real quick and give a basic overview. There's only like three or four missions you can send your task forces on. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, mission types. There we go, right here. All right, so you got Bombardment. Only ships assigned to this mission may conduct shore bombardment. Uh, limited to warships and oilers. Okay, you got transports. Only ships with a transport mission may load and unload cargo. No limitation on cargo ships. So basically your, your invasion forces. And they can have warships attached to them. It's just they are a transport task force. Uh, intercept. Most of the time, most of your war fleets, your 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 battleships, your cruisers, your carrier task forces are going to be set to an intercept, and then escort is you know whatever is pretty much going to be following along whatever other uh, task force they're escorting. So you could have a transport fleet loaded up with uh, nothing but troop transports, cargo ships, and maybe some oilers, maybe you know a couple three destroyers for anti aircraft, and then you could have a regular task group of cruisers and battleships on escort, and they would follow along doing whatever the transport does. Well, one of the problems that you run into when writing out these orders is that for bombardment and transport, you have to write all the orders out at the beginning, and they're stuck doing that until you either decide to abort their mission, they get sunk, or they succeed at their mission. Uh, which, if you're playing a very long campaign, like the, like the Coral Sea campaign, the operation that I'm going to be doing is going to be 10 days long, uh, so, and there are two invasion forces, there's going to be the, if there's going to be the invasion force that's going to land at Tulagi, and the invasion force that's going to land at Port Moresby, you've got to write all their orders out, turn by turn, until they get to Tulagi or Port Moresby unload their troops, or you know, at any time you can decide to abort, which in which case they immediately return to a uh, home port. But it's it kind of speeds up gameplay in kind of a grand scheme because yeah, you gotta you 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 have to do a lot of front end work figuring out all right what my turns are going to be writing them to get to Tulagi or to Port Moresby. Um, so that's kind of you kind of gotta have kind of a big picture going on and it takes a little bit to do that I, there's, there's, there's no real easy way to get it especially if you want to have some type of complicated plan now the good thing is intercept task forces which are mostly your carrier about your war task forces you only have to worry about plotting one turn ahead so you start off turn one 
or say you're on turn 12, you just start a turn 12. At the start of turn 12 during the orders phase, you write where they're going to move on turn 13. So the intercept groups have more flexibility in their orders writing, but the bombardment and transports, those are the ones that, that do take a little bit of work. Because if you misdo some of your orders, you're going to be throwing your entire command, uh, your command and control, well, not command and control, but your, your timetable uh, right out the window. So, and to complicate things even a little bit more is that one of the advanced rules that they recommend playing with is fuel consumption for the ships. Let's go ahead and take a look at one of the ship record logs. Yeah, so here's Japanese aircraft carriers. These are the fuel boxes. Now, carriers have got, looks from the looks of it, a lot of fuel. All right, and oh, there's an oiler. She's got lots of fuel as well. But then you get to the <clears throat> destroyers and transports. Where's the transport set? Let's take a look at, yeah, okay, well, transports kind of have some fuel too. Yeah. Basically, every space you move is... Okay, well, each one of these circles represents 24 zones of movement. So, if you're only moving at speed 1, each one of these fuel boxes, <clears throat> you have to move 24 zones, so it's going to be 24 separate movements because you're only moving if you're only moving at speed one which will be what four days so yeah moving at speed one you're not going through a lot of fuel so say for example yeah this destroyer the, the with with one two three four five fuel that's basically five times 24 120 uh units of fuel so it can go 120 movement or 120 turns moving at speed one, which is kind of respectable, but you're only moving at speed one. <laughs> the problem comes in when you decide to move faster than speed one. If you want to move at speed two, then every space you move into now counts as three. And since you're moving at speed two, you're going to do that twice because your speed is two. Whatever your fleet speed is, is how many areas you move on the map. So, from going from speed 1 to speed 2, speed 1, you move one zone, costs you one fuel unit. Moving speed 2, you move two, but it's costing you six fuel units. Can, can you see, see what, where the issue is starting to come into play? If you move speed 3, and thus moving three spaces a turn, let me see if I can find my chart, it goes up even ex exponentially more. I'll go ahead and take a look at our operational side of things. Where is it? Because I was looking at it earlier. Uh, I know they've got the fuel usage right here, but I thought they had a chart that had it all laid out. Oh, yeah, fuel mileage right here. So if you go on speed 0 to 1... You're basically, each turn, you're spending one twenty-fourth of your box. Like I said, each one of those fuel boxes represents 24 hexes of movement. If you're moving speed two, it's now costing you three fuel per hex. And they say this is one quarter a box, but it's six fuel units. I don't like the box terminology. My mind has a hard time uh, breaking that down. Each box is worth 24 fuel. Part of me just wants to completely wreck those uh, fuel boxes and just write out how many total fuel units it is. So, but looking at speed three, you're now spending four per hex, which means you're going to be spending 12 fuel for the entire turn to move three hexes, which is one half a box. And if your fleet, for some reason, goes speed four, you're spending six fuel per hex for a grand total of 24 fuel units for the entire turn, which is one complete fuel box. Well, let's take a look at these destroyers. Now, granted, these destroyers can't go speed four, but let's take a look at these destroyers right here. Those destroyers, yeah, these destroyers right here can go speed four. If they wanted to go speed four, each turn they'll be blowing through one fuel box. So they could go speed four, one, two, three, four, five, six. They could go speed four for one day, and then they'll be out of fuel. Now, granted, that's going to be 24 hexes of movement, and, you know, that is a rather impressive amount of, of movement you're doing on one of these boards. So I'm 
not sure if I'm going to be playing with the, I probably will play with the fuel rules for the U.S. side, um, just because it adds more realism in it, and honestly, I, I doubt I'll be moving my ships more than, you know, every once in a while I might crank them up to speed three, but it is something you need to be aware of, that if you're moving more than speed one or two in the operational thing, you're going to be blowing through a lot of fuel, and thus, you need to take, keep, and keep track and keep an eye on where your fuelers are. And yes, there are fuel ships. There are oilers out there. Let's see if I can find one in the U.S. Because I've kind of got the uh, U.S. markers out. Let's see, is that... Yeah, right there. So, yeah, right there. There's a fuel ship. And so you got to keep track of where he's at and give him a little bit of escort and try to keep him away from the action because if your fuel ships get blown up then you got to go back to port to get fuel and yeah it's a pain in the ass kind of reminds me a buddy of mine uh was mentioning when we were talking about the fleet series uh several months ago he thought he found the hack to uh to the fleet games it's like well you really want to hurt the opposing fleets you just go after their supply ships and i i said well Dude, that's kind of what we do in real life. That's, you know, that's not a hack. That's that's a tactic. You you want to protect your supply ships because they keep your ships going out at sea. And he kind of looked a bit dejected. Of those. Oh, I thought I found something. Well, no, it's a good tactic. It's just a tactic that everybody knows and realizes. And you need to protect your supply ships. And just, just like this game, it is possible to run out of fuel. It is possible to, re to be reduced to movement zero. And then you got to tow your ships around, and that's a real pain in the ass. So, like I said, as long as you're not moving any more than speed uh, speed two, you should be fine. There will be circumstances and situations where you're going to want to and will necessitate moving faster. It's just you got to keep aware of it if you're playing with those rules. Um, so, yeah, basically, and, you know, so let's go ahead and just put that that fleet there and say that task force there. Now, the thing is, this is not a double-blind system. You're going to know where specifically the enemy task force are at all times. Let me go ahead and grab a couple Japanese task force markers. Uh, so... You know, this could be a game that's in play right now. You know that the enemy task force are out there. You just don't know what's in them until your search planes actually identify or actually can find them. This leads to another interesting debate is that is there a need for a double blind system in a game such as this? For World War II... And I know everybody knows of Avalon Hill's Midway game. That's a double-blind system. Avalon Hill's Flat Top, which is a double-blind system. Uh, most carrier games out there you're going to find are double-blind systems. I am going to say that no, you really don't need a double-blind system. Uh, especially for, for carrier engagements. And really not even for just normal uh, naval engagements like a lot of the fighting that... Uh, you know, went on Guadalcanal and coming down the slot. Well, especially right, right there, coming down the slot. Um, of the six major carrier, well, not just six major. Of the six carrier engagements of the war, both sides knew the other side was out there. U.S. intelligence had cracked the Japanese codes. We knew that their carriers were there. We didn't know specifically, but we knew that, all right, they left from, say, Rabul at 0600 yesterday, and we know how far they can get, and we're pretty sure they're moving towards Port Moresby. We got a really good idea where exactly in the... Because ships only can move so fast. You can't move faster than the ship is capable. And if it's been 12 hours, well, you can kind of get a good idea where, where where they could potentially have gotten in those 12 hours. Um, but like I was saying, in in there was only one battle where either side was actually taken completely by surprise that, oh, shit, there's carriers out there. And that was at Midway. The Japanese were not expecting American carriers. That is the only battle, only of the, ma of the six major carrier engagements, where neither side had an idea that there was somebody out there. Carl C., Japanese knew we had at least one carrier in the area. We knew they had three carriers in the area. We cracked their code. Midway, we knew they had four carriers that were coming. Every single naval and back, you knew 
the carriers were out there. You didn't know exactly where it was. And people were, people may say, well, you, even though you don't know where exactly, you still got to find them. That's true. Again, take a look at most of the carrier battles that happened. You send out your search planes at dawn. Usually by 9 o'clock on both sides, you've spotted the enemy carriers and you're launching your craft. Very rarely did carriers get caught unaware with planes on the deck, with, again, the exception, I will say, Midway, because the Japanese had no clue that there were carriers at Midway. So when all of a sudden, you know, uh, the dive bombers start coming screaming out of the sky... Uh, it caught them completely unaware. And then eventually, when the torpedo planes came in a half hour later, when planes were still on the deck, really, really did nasty, bad things to the Japanese carriers. For the most part, it was a mutual... It, I don't want to say it was completely a mutual spotting because each side would spot each other relatively the same amount of time. The strikes would be launched. It'd be a couple hours for planes to get there and get back. And in that time, you were going to get struck. Um... So is there a need for a double-blind system when you take a look at the historical precedent that, no, you, you don't need a double-blind. You need search planes, definitely. And this game m does simulate that you do have to find... You may know where the enemy task force is, but you can't launch a strike on them unless you've spotted them with, with, with search planes. And you do that... Let's go ahead. Let's take a look at this card right here which is our airbase card. And you've got each of the airbases and the carriers for each engagement that was done. And so, for example, here we got Port Moresby, Tulagi, and you had T Townsville, Esprit de Santo, and then the carriers, uh, Lexington, Yorktown, and Tangler. She was a, a backup carrier. I think she had 12 or 16 uh, aircraft on her, if that... But at the beginning of every day, you decide what missions you want, be it ready, combat air patrol, search, or ASW. Well, you put an airplane on search and say, well, let's see, where's a, where's a good, let's use, can I find a seaplane? Oh, of course, I'm not going to be able to find a seaplane easily. Anyways, you put aircraft on search, and then when it comes to the search phase... All aircraft have a radius, so what you do is then, all right, we're going to see if we can spot this task force right here. We look to see how many planes that are on search missions are within range of that task force, and then that becomes the modifier to be able to search for them. Let's go ahead and take a look at the... I use this one because this sheet actually is a little bit better for the search table than the PDF that I've gotten off the internet. Let's see, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? That's, that's on the back. Yeah, air search modifiers right here. So, on a roll of three or greater, the task force is spotted. If you have three or four steps of search aircraft that are within range of that task force, you get a plus one. There's five or six steps of search aircraft, you get a plus two, so on and so forth. Spotted last turn, and you know, there's all these different modifiers. So if you don't put any splains on search, chances are you're not going to spot them. But if you have enough planes on search, you're going to spot them. Now, there's always a chance that you're not going to spot them, which is fine, like, because I think search is every turn. Yeah, it's every turn. So <laughs> you're going to eventually spot them if you got enough aircraft in, in, in the sky. And once you spot them, then you can take your aircraft that you've set to ready, because, you know, that's, that's the ready column are the planes that are going to be going on strikes. And as soon as you spotted them, then you can send them out and then do a strike on an enemy task force. Now, when you spot an enemy task force, it doesn't necessarily mean you know exactly all what's in there. Oh, no, 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 no. There is another dice roll you have to make. Uh, where's the spotting table? Yeah, the air search results. You roll on the air search results, and <laughs> so... If you spot a task force, you got to roll 2d6, and then that gives you your opponent... Well, your opponent... I think your opponent rolls the dice, and then he mod... Okay, so there's a little bit of trust that is required, that you hope that your opponent is rolling honestly, uh, and uh, is telling you the truth. But so if you roll a 6 through 8, then yeah, the actual number of types of ships in the task force are given. You roll a 9, your, your opponent can tell you the, the types of ships... And by plus or five minus of each type. Now you got to remember, the ship types are broken down. Oh, okay. By destroyers, 
transports, carriers, crews. I think actually, I think carriers and battleships are are are, are linked together in uh, capital ships. I can't remember how they break the capital ships down, but so even if you do spot the task force. There's no guarantee you're actually going to get the actual <laughs> the actual result, and that happened a lot. There were a lot of times they uh, uh, search planes would go out, they would spot something, and they would radio back giving the wrong intel. And it happened. A good example of it was during the Battle of Coral Sea. Um, the U.S. task forces were, I think, they were pretty much right here in this area, and the Japanese carrier task forces were in this area. But the U.S. had another task force way off down here that consisted of the oiler. In fact, it was that oiler I so showed you earlier, the Soho. Uh, I think it was the Soho, the Neo Soho. Neo, yeah, this one. I'm fairly certain it was the Neo Show and a destroyer escort were way off down here, you know, a couple hundred miles away from the main task force. But the Japanese pilot that spotted them reported it as an aircraft carrier task group. So the Japanese launched a strike at it. When they got there, they found out it was just a, a tanker and a destroyer. And of course, they sank the tanker and destroyer. Um, and another time, the U.S. task force, one of, one, of the, one of the search planes from the U.S. task force, identity, identified a task force and completely con conflated the numbers. Um, it wasn't kind of his fault. It's the, the, the uh, crypto system basically conflated. He said he had spotted like four cruisers and six destroyers, and it conflated it to eight battleships and 12 cruisers, something silly like that. So misidentification was always there. So even when you spot the enemy task force, you're not really sure what's in it until your planes actually get there. So do I think there that a double-blind system is needed? Not really. I mean, the, the rules that are set up in this, and I know there are going to be old purists out there who are going to yell at me, but again, you just take, take a look overall at carrier engagements. It didn't get jumped very often. You knew carriers were in the area. You knew enemy carriers. You may not know exactly where they're at, but you know enough where they're at that your search planes are out there looking for them. And, you know, like I said, a lot of, in, in the grand scheme of things, spottings, you spotted each other's carriers simultaneously. Now, granted, there were sometimes uh, slight mistakes in it. Like, at one point during the Battle of Coral Sea, the two, the, the, the two main carrier task forces were like 70 miles apart from each other. Part of that is because... Well, the U.S. had actually sent their, their, a majority of their search planes in the wrong direction and didn't realize the, the Japanese carrier task force was coming at them from a different direction. But the uh, U.S. Uh, task force was under cloud cover, and the Japanese spotting planes just didn't see them. So, anyway, that's my little dissertation and my little argument of why double-blind is not really needed. Yeah, sure, it's kind of fun trying to hunt your opponent down, but it's not really needed. So, anyways, that's 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 how it is. And so, when you commit your orders, it's you write your orders beforehand, except for like intercept. You do that one turn before, and you know I don't know if you can see them can see them real clear because I know there is a little bit of glare. <laughs> but each square has got it's like Q twenty or O twenty or Q twenty Q twenty one twenty two twenty three so on and so forth. You just write down. It's like all right, they're sped at, set at speed two, so it's going to move two 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 hexes. So I want them to move to Q nineteen and P eighteen. Uh, during the movement, during the operational movement phase, you just move them like that. Now, there is a chance that task force, enemy task forces can move into or through the same hex or square during their turn, and there are rules for that for if you get an engagement like that, that people, that, that they trip across each other. So... Uh, we're hitting 30 minutes. Oh, I'm going to have to download this to the computer real quick because my hard drive isn't that big. So I will be right back and we will continue this. All right. So anyways, that is basic uh, operational movement and spotting each other's task forces uh, on the battleboard.
or on the operational board. So what happens when you've actually spotted the enemy? Well, when you spotted them, that's when you take your aircraft that are all set on already, that, they, that they're not on cap, not on search, and not on ASW, and that's when you can send them out to the opposing task forces to try to done sink them. Because that's basically what the job... I don't care what anybody says. At the end of the day, the job of any Navy is to go out, wreck the enemy shit, kill their troops, and project sea force. That, that's what the Navy's for. That's what we do. That's what we did. So, you gotta blow them up. And in World War II, the best way of blowing, up, blowing them up was sending your aircraft carrier planes against their task forces. And that happened a lot. So... Since each turn is basically four hours, and, and really, with the range of World War II aircraft, that's pretty much, you send the strike out and it came back within four hours. So there really isn't very many times where you're going to be sending aircraft out that's going to be in flight more than one turn. So you, there are really no counters. I think the earlier games had counters for airstrike groups, but you just declare... All right, this we're launching carriers. Actually, you don't even have to say where they're coming from. You just say that you're launching the carrier, launching the planes, and what task force they're striking. It's like, I want to attack that task force. All right, fine. Planes get there. You flip it over. Task force three. You look at the task force card. What air? What ships are in there? And then you go to the battle board because I did have a couple people asking about that. I mean. Uh, it, when it comes to airstrikes, do you use the tactical board? And yes, you do use the tactical board, but not the same way you use it during tactical combat. Um, basically, for airstrikes, you basically, sh if I remember correctly, and it's been a few days since I read it, and since I've just read it and haven't played it, I mean, I'm kind of going off a of theory craft here. Uh, you place one ship per hex, and I think there has to be one, and you can place another ship you can't place ships adjacent to each other. It has to be at least one hex between each ships. So you place them all out on the battle board. Now, it's kind of cool and convenient in, like, mid or in Coral Sea on the back side. Air focus. You've got the silhouettes, just some blank silhouettes. Where on the front side, you know, you've got, you've got the top-down view. In SOPAC and in the others, you've got uh, the, the top-down view on one side and the, the silhouette, the actual ship silhouette on the other side. So, but it's kind of cool about this one. So you can set them up with the silhouette side and, you know, you, your opponent's not going to know what ships are what. And then he basically takes his strike aircraft counters. You know, here's... Uh, oh, well, there's there's a search plane I was looking for. There's a PBY. Uh, so let's not use that as an example because a PBY is not going to be attacking something. Okay, what do we... That's an F4F. That's a fighter. Fighter isn't going to be attacking anything. All right. There, there we go. There we go. SBD. That's a dive bomber. And so you take your flights, be it at full strength or at half strength, and you basically place them on the ships you want to attack that have been placed on the tactical board. And then the opponent gets his anti-aircraft fire, and I think uh, anti-aircraft range is like two hexes. So basically, a ship that's being shot at, plus whatever else you want that's within two hexes, can throw its anti-aircraft fire up. So that's kind of sometimes why you want to spread out your, your, your strike aircraft, um, because if, I think if I read the rules correctly, if an aircraft is striking a ship it can't give its anti-aircraft value to another ship. So you kind of want to strike... I mean, hey, if you want to dump all your ships onto one target, sure, go ahead, knock yourself out. Better hope it's an actual carrier, not a destroyer, and has got, you know, what, one, two, three, four, six ships around it that can give supporting anti-aircraft fire or whatnot. So there is... There is, there is that, that is basically how strikes are. And once strikes are done... You, you roll anti-aircraft, you take losses, survivors get to do their strikes, roll the hits, yada, 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 bim, boom, bomb, you're done, you take everything out. There is no maneuvering on the tactical board during the airstrike phase. It's just, yes, he's here at the airstrike. They could have just really simplified it, and kind of like how sick the Fleet Series and Victory Games does, where you just line up all your ships in a row. And this is, like I said, this is how Six Fleet does it. Well, let's go ahead and... You know, just line up your ships in a row. 
and then the opponent places, all right, I want that strike there, that strike there. Or if you're running with missiles, you know, you break down what, how many missile strikes and how much air strikes is going to each individual ship, and then work out the aircraft, the anti-aircraft values from that way, and then roll damage or anything like that. They could have done it that way, so I think it's kind of cool that they do allow you to use the tactical map to set everything up. Does it slow things down a little bit? Yeah, sure, but again, it's kind of cool to see all the ships laid out in their tactical formation, where you put all your, your ships at. Now, granted, there's also cap. Your cap can your your combat air patrol can bounce you before you even get to the target. There's rules for that, uh, and then counter cap and all that kind of good stuff. But yeah, so to answer the question, is is the airstrikes resolved on the tactical board? Yes, it is, and it's kind of cool. I, I kind of like the mechanic they have for that. Um, submarine warfare, anti-submarine warfare. Now, conversely, ASW warfare is con conducted abstractly. You do have submarine task forces, and I don't think... I think the earlier games had actual markers for submarines, but basically, at the beginning of the game, you, you identify in their setup an area that's got a submarine in it. Your opponent can do ASW warfare. That is one of the columns that you can put air, air onto. So they can look for the enemy subs. But basically, submarine warfare is handled abstractly. If your ASW does manage to spot them, then they can try to attack the submarine. And that's all done. That's all done abstractly with just a quick couple dice rolls. But if for some reason you're moving a task force around, if you come within two spaces of a submarine, one of your own submarine groups, and you don't have to tell them... It, as long as sometime in their movement, the task force came within two squares of one of your submarines, then you can do a submarine strike. And there's, there's charts and there's tables, and you resolve that abstractly. You don't go to the tactical board for that. Um, so, that you know, it's kind of cool that that, that that is some kind of hidden mechanic that, all right, you know, okay, so this, this carrier moved two hexes, and, or this task force moved two spaces, and the opponent says, all right, I get a substrike on you. Well, you don't know where <laughs> you came across. It could have been here, could have been here. So somewhere within two hexes of wherever you moved, you know that the enemy submarines are at. Uh, but submarines are real slow moving. I think they move like one square every other turn. Uh, I didn't read too deep into the rules just just to just to get the basics of them. Um, and honestly, carriers uh, during Coral Sea weren't that important. Uh, I think the Japanese had like three or four carriers that were opera operating up around the Rabul area. They never got down into you know the Solomon Islands or anywhere near Port Moresby. And they sure as hell weren't operating off uh, Sprita Santu or off Australia. I think the U.S. had a couple, had a few submarines as well, but again, I think they were pretty much within the, within the, uh, within sight of, uh, well, relatively speaking, of Australia. They didn't get way deep waters or in the Solomons or by Rabu or anything like that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, it's kind of basically how, how the operational game goes. I mean, let's, let's take a look at the sequence of play real quick. All right. So this is done. Uh, campaign scenario. Yep. Assign ships and missions to task forces. Oh, yeah. And the only time you can change a task force mission is if they're in port and spend six turns in port. So you could have like a bombardment group. Say you have a bombardment task force leaving from Rabul and you want to bomb, you know, shell Port Moresby. So you have to, at the beginning of the game, you know, direct them, move down towards Port Moresby, and then they have to spend, I don't know, three, four turns bombing, whatever. And then you have to write their orders to get back. Once they get back to Rabul and spend six turns there, you can now take that bombardment. You can put them on another bombardment order, or you can turn them into an intercept task force and then have them start moving all over wherever they want. All right, so here we go. Campaign game turn. Now this is every turn. This isn't this isn't by by at the start of the day or anything like that. Uh, I think because I could have sworn yeah because it says here check for whether I think all right all right all right uh, let's check that real quick. I may have gotten confused. <laughs> Again, very possible 
my normal caveat, I am not a clever man. This is not, you don't watch my videos for this is exactly how to play. This My videos are, this is how I play, and this is a pretty close approximation, and if you kind of like it, then that'll give you an idea if you want to go out and spend your own money on it. <laughs> um, yeah, each game turn represents four hours. Oh, it is, and it is. Play proceeds as follows. Okay. Weather phase, air patrol phase, order phase, air search, air mission assignment, naval movement, submarine attack. Okay, so then, let's see. Because there's something that you set for the entire day. It's the aircraft that you, when you assign them a mission... Let me check that real quick. Air operations, aircraft basing, capacity, base card, limitations, readiness. During the air patrol phase, aircraft may be assigned to patrol duty. Da, 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 da. Place aircraft to search. During the airstrike phase, flights, organization, mission assignments. I may have to go back and read that again, because I could have swore. That when you put aircraft on a mission, they're on that mission for the entire day. OK, I'm, yeah, I'm going to have to read that again. And again, I'm going to go over the rules before I sit down. That's kind of why there this video is out there. I, I have not found any other videos out there going over you know, the operational side of how this is supposed to be played. So anyways, let's take a look. So campaign game turn. Check weather. We've got a weather track right here. Scenarios tells you how it starts off, and then every turn, you're old to see if the weather changes. And here's the weather modifier down here, and yada, 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 yada. Now, I have a slight issue with the weather, because this is a big area of map. I mean, each square is 60 kilometers or 60 miles or something silly. It's 60 something. It's big. There should be sectors, and of course, this would complicate the games immensely, that you're going to have, say, cloud cover here, but it could be clear here, but you could also have rain squalls here. I mean, I, I don't like the uniform, all right, this is the weather for the entire map doesn't work like that in real life. I know. I spent a lot of time floating around the Pacific. We'd be sailing along, all of a sudden hit a rain squall, be in that for 20 minutes, come out of it. 30 minutes later, we'd be completely a sunny skies. And then, you know, after that, you know, run into a storm front. You know, it just it's just the way it works. So I don't like that you uniformly... The, the weather is... I mean, again, it's it, it it's for ease of play. I get it. Breaking this down into bigger sectors and then having to check weather in each sector. There's more things you got to pay attention to. It's a pain in the butt. That, <laughs> for all the other things that the game does, that's the one thing that does kind of bug me. I don't know why. It's a minor point, but it is what it is. All right. So then assign aircraft in ready boxes to cap, search, and ASW missions. Write orders for fleets required numbers to turn ahead, yada, yada, yada. Assign aircraft in ready box to strike missions. Move fleets, check for contact between surface fleets, resolve tactical combat, check for combat, attack by submarines, and resolve submarine attacks, airstrike missions planned in step five, which is assign aircraft and ready to airstrike mission, uh, special missions executed by ships that have done nothing else this term, bar, load, unload, refuel, reinforcements, yada, 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 and then aircraft that cannot stay aloft for another turn must return to base or be lost. So there are a few aircraft that have uh, multiple multi-turn... Let's see if I can find it. Because we had the PBY. So the PBY... Oh, focus. So the movement is 16-2. So that means it, its base movement is 16, but it can stay out for two turns. So we can go 16 out one turn and then 16 back the, same, at the next turn. So, yeah, I am going to have to read over the, those rules a little bit more for searches and strikes and everything, because I could have swore that CAP, Search, and ASW, oops, that 
cab search and ASW missions were done at the beginning of the day, but it looks like it's done by turn. So I'm going to have to read into that a little bit more, which is no, which is fine. That's that's what I'm doing this for. Um, so that's that's basically air operations. Uh, is there anything else that I really wanted to go over for this? I don't think so. I think that pretty much breaks down the flow of how the operational turn goes, except for my obviously poor mishandling of the aircraft rules. But we'll get those we'll get those figured out before we actually sit down to start playing. Uh, but yeah, like I said, I wanted to get this out because I wanted to explain a lot of what went on on the operational side of things. So I'm not explaining it. Of course, I am going to explain stuff when I'm playing it. This will at least give an I give people an idea of what I'm doing without me having to go into, you know, basically 45 minutes of discussion like I just did. So, all righty. I think that's going to be it. I don't know when I'm going to actually sit down to get this started playing. Um, since I am going to be playing at Solitaire, I am going to be using... Uh, Second World War C solitaire tables for operating the Japanese fleet movements because I am going to be playing as the Americans or the Allies in this one. Um, so basically, with, at, the, at each task force, you find out, all right, this is the speed they're moving. Submarines. And then you roll the direction. Since I'm not going to plot out the Japanese troop transports and all that, I'm just going to say, all right, the Tulagi invasion force, obvious main goal is going to be Tulagi. So every turn I'm going to roll, all right, how fast are they moving and what direction? And we'll just go off the desired direction is whatever their target is. So for the Tulagi invasion force, you know, this, okay, say I roll a seven. So they so say I roll 10, they roll, they move full speed. So they'll move full speed and say I roll for direction of seven of desired direction. So they'll move full speed towards Tulagi. And it's going to be the same with Port Moresby. What I'll do, any escort, uh, the carrier groups, I'm going to identify U.S. task forces as their primary target and they'll move, move towards them. And I might, might, might mix things up a little bit. Uh, prioritizing uh, if multiple task forces, prioritizing which one is more. And I'll do, I'll, 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 I'll do a, what I consider a logical approach to it. What I think if I was playing a human opponent, what they would do. Um, so that's basically and how we're going to be doing in solitaire. And for air unit missions, again, you've got, you know, you've got tables for all that as well. I am not going to be keeping track of fuel for the Japanese forces when I play the sol the play as solitaire because again we're using this random table. Um, <laughs> like we've seen, go full speed too much, you're going to blow. And there's no rules in here for how to refuel or or no tables. So I'm going to give the Japanese that as an quote unquote artificial intelligence edge that I'm not going to keep track of their fuel, but I'm probably going to keep track of my fuel. Um, just because again, the, the quote unquote AI isn't that smart. I mean, it's just going off of predetermined tables. So I kind of got to give them some kind of edge. So I figure, yeah, all right. They don't have to worry about fuel. That's, that's, that's kind of the, cause like I said, all right, what happens if ships do run out of fuel? I don't have anything set up for Oilers to come out and refuel them or a human player would not purposely run out his ships and run them out of fuel without a tanker being nearby. So anyways, that's how we're going to be doing that. So that's going to how that's going to be. Um, the actual campaign, the actual operation itself for Coral Sea, the actual fight, the Coral Sea carrier battle was only like two or three days. Um, however, the full operation is 10 days long um, and is going to be mainly focusing the opening stages of capturing Tulagi Air for, Airport or uh, Tulagi Air Base. Um, and that's going to take like three days for the Japanese ships to get there and then, you know, start moving to Port Moresby. And so, uh, yeah, I think that's all I got. Is there anything else? I don't think I got anything else. <sighs> Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms in the comment section. I'll see everybody next time. See ya!